Welcome, good evening. Welcome to those who were able to come and join us in person and welcome to those who are following this online. We are very happy today to present the catalogue of the intervention No Fear of Glass by uh, Sabine Marcellis just before COVID. And, um, well, just as a reminder, as you know, the Barcelona Pavilion hosts regularly art interventions. We design artists, architects, designers, like is the case, to explore and transform the Barcelona Pavilion. So we keep trying to learn and uh, have different looks at this outstanding space. Um, it's always uh, site-specific interventions that transform the space and transform the way we experience it. And then, uh, after hosting the interventions, uh, we produce the catalogs. We never have the catalogs at the same time, not only because we are a, a small size institution and we don't always have the time, but mostly because we want to see how it works we want people who were able to see it to later talk about it or explain their uh, understanding of the transformation they witness. And this is the case. Uh, so uh, in this case, it's kind of almost two years later, we are able to present you the catalog that will, uh, that will fix uh, what happened and will help us uh, re discover the amazing experience that it was. So uh, thank you to all those who made it possible in that moment. Thank you to Sabine especially, and thank you for being with us today to present this catalog. I give the word to Luis Sendino, who was a key in making this possible. Thank you, Luis. Hello, good evening to everybody. And uh, no, me, uh, in the name of Site Gallery, that is the gallery who is representing the work of Sabine Marcellis, uh, we are really happy, and uh, we were very happy uh, at the first time just doing here the intervention, and all the was extremely easy with all, uh, with everybody working here, with Ivan, Anna, everybody was like super uh, supporting and helpful, and uh, also with the catalog, uh, everything was like very. Very easy. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is like, uh, as Anna said, this is comes after two years. Uh, we did it, like, the intervention in 2019, in December, just before COVID, and uh, we wouldn't be able just to present all these pieces and um, to and to show um, out of the of the intervention. This past September, we saw um, some of the pieces in the, during our Basel during the the, the, the fair, and um, there was like great reaction of people. And uh, now we are releasing the catalog. Uh, that's also uh, a pleasure, and um, I really like. I mean, it's like amazing catalog, and uh, we're still be happy about quality and about uh, uh, obviously. Thanks to the to the um, architects who wrote all the text to Hippolito and to Anna to um, collaborate with us and um, yeah so I mean we are here just to talk a bit about what's like happening and how how we did it how everything started and uh, yeah no I mean like hope you enjoy no thank you. Uh, hello. Everyone, I'm super happy to be back here after yeah almost two years, um, and to to present the book that um, yeah informs the the exhibition from 2019. Um, and yeah, I mean, thank you very much again to the to the foundation for inviting me to to do this project. Um, Side gallery, my whole team. I you know I wouldn't be able to do anything without you guys. Um, Sophia for the design of the book, Pim for the beautiful photography. Um, yeah, I, I hope that everyone enjoys the book and yeah. So good evening, by the way, 
We're speaking about the book, so the book is here, and we're really happy that it was possible. We just received it some hours ago. It was still kind of warm uh, when it arrived, uh, but it's been a really amazing journey. And I want to uh, thank you all for being here. It's a, pl a pleasure to have this conversation today with you, Sabine, Luis, and we also have Hippolito, Pestellini, and Anna Pujane. Uh, hi there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I remember that the first time that we spoke together about the book with Sabine and Luis, sorry about the book, about this intervention, um, uh, and then finally we had these objects, furniture. We'll see how, how we should call these, uh, these elements uh, later on. I think this will be part of the conversation uh, as well, which were in different spaces of the pavilion here. And the first conversation, already this uh, book, Fear of Glass, the title in English by Josep Ketglas, uh, as the departure point of this journey towards the intervention in the book already uh, came up. And both you, Hippolito, and Anna um, uh, speak about this, uh, this connection to the pavilion and also uh, uh, regarding the work of, uh, of Sabine. As Hippolito, you point out in, in your text, in the book, the practice of Sabine, you say, is not industrial nor strictly functional. And the Barcelona chairs were uh, supposed to be industrial and have become so, but at the beginning they were not. And I would like to ask you, Hippolito, how you became acquainted to the work of Sabine and what intrigued you about, uh, about her work? Hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to reflect uh, about the work of Sabine. We're not Since hearing you. Have... you. We don't hear you. We see oh. you. Let me, is... can you hear me? Hello again? We're not hearing you yet, no? My... Let's see, Anna, can we see if we hear you? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing Anna, that works well, perfect. And Hippolito, uh, we'll have to uh, check. This has never happened before, it's the first time. <laughs> Well, in any Hello. case, I, okay, Yay. great, Hippolito. Yep, now it works perfectly. Thank you. So I was asking you about this acquaintance to the work of Sabine. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been uh, really uh, interesting and a pleasure to reflect on Sabine's work. Uh, we know each other since a long time, so let, let's set that up first. Um, um, we were, I, when I was at, OMA, um, I knew Sabine uh, through various friends and I knew her work because we were basically living in the same city and at some point um, we had the chance to actually meet um, first simply uh, socially and then I had the chance to interview her. Actually, that was maybe one of the first interviews that Sabine made it was on the a magazine. Uh, it was very funny because uh, I didn't know very well the work of Sabine. And then it simply, she opened up this amazing landscape of material research that was really, and still is at the core of her practice. And I totally got fascinated by um, the sort of rigor and yet um, aesthetic sense of her work. Um, and I thought, at one point that it would have been interesting to stress uh, this collaboration between us and her on a scale that was not the one of an object. So we involved Sabine, I think for the first time um, in a project that was actually a small architectural intervention in Place Vendôme in Paris, um, where in a way her focus on materials and her focus on reflections and colors and was treated on a scale that was architectural, not any longer the one of an object. So we were kind of, you know, exchanging on the scale that I'm personally more used to and on a scale that she was actually exploring, uh, maybe one of the first times. Um, and I was looking for something, um, or we were looking for something that was, uh, for a designer, able to deal with bigger spaces, but also able to give a different meaning to the notion of glass and reflection and to the notion of color, 
able to make basically materials that are really consolidated in the tradition of architecture, in the modernist tradition to architecture, a different new character. And in a way, we, we, we sort of felt a perfect match with the work and the attitude, most importantly, of Sabine. So it seems like a it makes... Long time ago, long time ago. So I, I like to recall that, that moment, actually. So it seems like it makes a lot of sense that also this intervention took place here in the Barcelona Pavilion, no? After, well, we'll speak about that as well. But I also want to ask Anna uh, a question, because in your text, in, in the book, you speak about fragility and control connected to the use of glass, no? And speaking of glass will be something that has appeared constantly in, in the work of Sabine. And you also speak about its, uh, the political connotations of glass. And I think this was something really, really interesting in, in the text that I recommend that you read. And I would like to know a little bit more of this idea of furniture understood as an amplifier of history and of politics that you that you speak about. Yeah, thank you. Also, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy um, to be here with you. I'm so sorry not to be there, actually, physically with you. Um, uh, so thanks for the invitation. And yeah, I think I think that Sabine's uh, work is um, it's very provocative. Um, first of all, with the title itself, right? Um, the title, No Fear of Glass, assumes that we do fear glass. And obviously it recalls to uh, Pep Hecla's book, but I think it's much more complex than uh, that assumption. So why we should fear glass and probably um, uh, that question uh, has not a simple answer um, because glass has a lot of connotations, symbolic connotations, cultural connotations. So we have, you know, we could um, uh, uh, relate it to our modern connotations of transparency, of hygiene, and maybe all those connotations do relate uh, with the fact that most of our scientific um, uh, evolutions uh, do relate with glass, as for instance, a microscope. But we do have also other connotations like um, surveillance and control, as you were mentioning, uh, Ivan, that also do relate with, uh, you know, the uh, emerge of certain types of glass, like for instance, the uh, one uh, mirror glass uh, type that was uh, invented in 1903 and that has been largely used in uh, surveillance rooms, in interrogation rooms, and so on. So, you know, glass has a complex uh, system of connotations, but what happens when uh, glass is uh, related with the pavilion itself through Sabine's work? Um, then um, the relation is even much more complex uh, because the pavilion itself is a history of memory. So it talks all the time about actual uh, memory, actual context, but also a memory of the past. And it recalls first, obviously, to the first pavilion, 1929 pavilion, in which glass was presented there um, alongside other materials like textile, stones, and etc., and, and metal. And all these materials were displayed not as products, uh, but actually as complex devices able to uh, talk about a method of uh, society that was at the time the German post war society. And glass, among all these materials, was one of the protagonists because uh, at that time, Germany was one of the pioneers in the, in, the, in the global market of glass. And that happened thanks to, among other voices, Otto Schott, who started to relate uh, chemical compositions of glass with the capacities, with the properties of glass. And thanks to uh, that, those researchers started, for instance, using uh, borosilicate, who, uh, which material uh, improve uh, and allow the emerge of cluster of uh, performance. So that's why, for instance, we have uh, the possibility for the uh, first time to use large pieces of glass. So the glass at the pavilion also referred to those technological um, advantages and political as at the same time connotations. Um, so the work of uh, Lily Reich and I mean, Ms. Van der Rohe cannot be detached of all those entanglements, complex political and industrial entanglements. And uh, when talking about uh, Sabine's work, 
I think that what it's interesting also is not only to refer to that original construction of the pavilion, but to the reconstruction as well. And once again, the political connotation of the pavilion changed completely. So the political connotation of, of the reconstruction of 19, 1986, it's completely different to the political connotations of the original pavilion. In 1986, the pavilion suddenly became this device able to relate the city of Barcelona with an international uh, 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 um, sphere uh, that happened with, you know, uh, after the dictatorship uh, years. So suddenly uh, the pavilion meant it, the international relation of the city with uh, other territories. Um, but going beyond that, um, uh, Sabine Works talks us about other reconstructions of the pavilion, like, for instance, OMA in 1985. Uh, Casa Palestra, that uh, uh, deformed the original pavilion, uh, the original Reich and, and Mies pavilion in Triennale de Milano, or recalling also the same installations that have happened in the Mies pavilion, like for instance, Sana uh, installation that uh, uh, installed a set of polycarbonate wall, recalling the elections of the original pavilion. Um, what is interesting about the actual intervention of Spain is that while Casa Pesta or Sana installation didn't reflect on the technological capacity or the technological meaning of the original pavilion, she actually brings back that in, through her installation. And uh, probably my question to Sabine would be at this point, beyond, going beyond um, the political relations that she can establish with her actual work and the past work. I would ask her also the technological implications of her work and if she can do more with the class. Um, it, yeah, it was a little bit difficult to hear you at the end of it, but um, so you're asking about the I think it would be kind of interesting to also see you know, uh, how you bring, for example, glass or the materials that you work with to this kind of limit, to the edge, and that how you work with technology, but also with these craftsmen uh, that you've known for a long time. Uh, Cipolito that explains that also in his text, no? And, and that, that connection. Um, yeah, it's actually also funny that you were mentioning about you know, all this technological advances in Germany at the time because I actually had to, I, I always collaborate with a Dutch company with glass, but because the scale is derived, or the scale of the pieces is derived from the scale of the pavilion, which is, is actually much bigger than, it's, it's like bigger than human scale here. So the pieces were also very big and actually too big to produce in the Netherlands. So we had to go to this one factory in Germany and collaborate with them to be able to to produce these, you know, as big as possible um, bent um, sheets of glass. Um, and yeah, I think this is this is always the the funnest part of my my job actually that there is an idea, a very sort of pure concept of wanting to sort of extrude the materiality of the pavilion and to to use the pavilion as the starting point for um, functional furniture pieces um, and then you know what came out of that then we had to figure out how on earth to produce that um, the fountain especially was like the craziest challenge um, but that it, that's that's the funnest part like really trying to work with your production partners and you know in the beginning everyone's like no impossible we're not doing that but then slowly you get people excited about it and they're like okay okay let's try let's try um, and then somehow it all comes together and you yeah you end up with a with these pieces that were extremely difficult to produce but they i like they look very simple in a sense and i think that's that's always the challenge to make something look effortless which i feel it's the same in this building it just everything is in its place everything feels perfect and calm but there is a, a, a very complex structure behind it all in fact, uh, Mies and Rake were also involved in the production processes of uh, in the uh, of the construction of their buildings. No, here, for example, the stonemasons, the glass and steel manufacturers, the textile industries, uh, other artisans, and Hippolyte, you speak about 
uh, this hands-on attitude that uh, Sabine has in her work and this connection to the modern uh, legacy of the 20th century in the way that she works, you say, far from the neoliberal framework. In this attitude, <coughs> do you also find this kind of connection with the work of the place that we are right now in the pavilion? Well, I think there is um, something that actually is connected to the question that I wanted to ask to Sabine. Um, she embodies a kind of new kind of professional or a new kind of designer that is liberated by the connection of mass production in a way and therefore mass consumption and moves at the edge of the design world in order to basically produce and conduct their own research rather independently where the frictions are coming from the very processes that she's actually interfering with. So I really much like the connection that Anna was making to the politics and to the technological progress uh, that were actually at the core of the making of an old area and of these architectural artifacts precisely. I think we're actually witnessing maybe through professions like Sabine, uh, sort of different or new, uh, maybe third and fourth industrial revolution where the processes are actually again incorporated at the scale of the practice of the single designer that is able to basically master the entire production and decide what kind of pieces uh, actually to produce, where to position them, and where to position them outside and independently from the neoliberal framework in which mass production, for the better and for the worse, is actually totally embedded. The question that I had for Sabine is actually about scale, um, and I think it relates to this. Um, you know, Ivan invited me to read the a book by Josep Ketlax um, um, in, in, in preparation of the text, but also to reflect more deeply about uh, the pavilion itself and the work of Sabine in the pavilion. And in the text, I mention a quote. He basically defines the pavilion both as a Doric temple and as a theater. So basically a stage where we visitors, the reflections that are kind of projecting, that we are kind of projecting on the materials, the reflection of the environments are actually part of one single ritual. But the objects per se, so the chairs, the textiles, were basically ghosts uh, within a petrified performance. What I think is really interesting in the work of Sabine is that by reconciling the scale of the single objects to the scale of the architecture, she's actually putting back at the center of the stage um, her pieces in a way, because the architecture is the very raison d'etre in a way of those pieces, not just in terms of proportions and materials, but in the way that it's actually, they are actually questioning, as Anna was mentioning, the Cartesian order that generated this pavilion in first place. Each piece, I think the intervention of Sabine in a way is totally architectural, it's not about positioning objects or like designing a piece as opposed to another. It's actually finding new relationships which were absent before. That the pieces in the way that they're designed, in the way they're actually combining materials are unlocking. And again, going back to the book, Fear of Glass, he mentions about this collage attitude as a critical architectural approach that means actually used by combining and designing the pavilion. So the question of Sabine is about scale, to Sabine is actually about scale again, and what defines actually an object or an architecture? And whether you know scale is still relevant to define an architecture or an object. In your practice, obviously, not <laughs> in general. Yeah, true. I think it's all it's all on a line, no? And it, it, it depends where you put it because I feel also the pavilion, it's obviously it's, it's an architectural icon, but the, the function of it also makes it, maybe it can also be seen as an object. Um, and I think for, yeah, in a sense, I maybe avoid these kind of questions in my studio as well, because I, I think the more I personally think about putting things in boxes, like is it art, is it design, is it, is it an object, is it, is it architecture? Um, I think when you're w w working with materials, um, it, 
the material can be applied to any of those things. And for me and, and my studio, I think we're just constantly trying to see what we can use the material for. And, and it, yeah, it can be very small scale, it can become you know, larger scale. Obviously, you have different collaborators depending on the scale because when it starts to sort of dabble towards architecture, then you need to work with engineers and people that are actually architects to, to, to have the knowledge. Um, so I, th I, I feel very fortunate that I can play along that scale. Um, but, but yeah, I, maybe I choose to not define when things become object or, or architecture, I don't know. <laughs> It's interesting also to follow up with this uh, idea of the objects uh, in the pavilion, which can become kind of ghosts, and also in many of the photos from 1929, in which we don't see people, but we see, for example, uh, the chairs uh, that were here. Uh, like we are looking towards the skylight, and we do not see people nearly in any of the photos, but we do imagine how people or the king and queen, which were supposed to sit on them and probably did not, uh, how they were to use it, no? or with the stools and so. Uh, and as well with some of the other objects, no? how they would kind of walk along this uh, space where we are right now. And in your case, uh, Sabine, you decided uh, to create these two chaise longues in two different positions. There was not the king and the queen looking one next to the other and looking forward like we are doing now, but in that case, they were kind of, one of them was looking towards, we could say the outdoors there, the other one was looking towards the sculpture over here. Then there was this ninth pillar that Polito also speaks about, no? which is also an element of reflections and it's also like the light well over there, an element where there can be light reflected when there's no artificial light, but when there's the artificial light, then it can be used as a lamp or the water fountain. Originally, probably there was some kind of pump and so sound uh, might have been present. We don't, uh, we don't know, but there's this establishment of the elements uh, with how people use them and how people imagine that they can be used. And Maybe I would like to, to ask you about this, how you see people kind of interacting or, uh, or, or, or seeing uh, how they should use, if they should sit or not. Yeah, I think that's interesting because when we were working on it, and for me, it was quite natural to take a seat in them. But I think with this like no fear of glass or fear of glass, I don't think anyone dared to touch them or to even dare to sit on them at all. Um, and I think even now, still, a lot of people don't even realize that they, they're also designed with ergonomics in mind. Like, they are functional chaise longs. The way that the, the travertine curve, it really is designed with the, the shape of the neck in mind. Um, and, yeah, I think if, if this was, a, a, you know, a place where you could be alone, um, then I think it, it is about contemplation. It's about enjoying the pavilion. So you have these different viewpoints um, where the double chaise long, it's meant for two people to, to have that view, the single one to have this view. Um, and yeah, the light, uh, which it's something that also has a, a day and night idea because if, you know, when it's off, it, it really is kind of camouflaging um, sort of hiding between the other pillars. Um, but then when it's on, you, all of a sudden it, it sort of reveals its function. So I think maybe the pieces, they, they're sort of hiding their function as well because it's not apparent from the, from the get-go. You sort of see them, but then it's like, oh, I can actually sit in it, or oh, it's actually a light. Um, which was not an intended thing, but I think uh, with, with glass, people yeah have something that, you have to be very careful with it, and, and, but at the end of the day, they're very sturdy, yeah. Would you like to ask Hippolito and Anna something, maybe? Uh, we have them here. I want to ask. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I would love, can you hear me well now? Yeah. Now it's fine. Yes, okay, now good. it works perfectly. Sorry. Sorry about before. Um, no, I just want to. I just want to expand the conversation about um, Sabine's technological approach, and I would love Sabine to talk further about how everything started, uh, why your work has been always um, 
uh, dealing with uh, pushing forward um, how things are built and being aware of that and making those processes also visible through form materiality. Uh, can you, I would, I'm just curious, it's almost a personal question, <laughs> how everything has started. Um, I think, um, well, I just have a curiosity for how things are made. Um, and I love nothing more than going to a factory and, and seeing the process and then trying to understand or trying to be creative with that. And like, well, what if it's done slightly different? What could you then create? Um, so I think for me, the way, the only way I know how to design is, is in that way. I, I'm not the type of designer that would sit down and sketch their next design and then it sort of becomes. Um, it really starts with the production process. Um, and with my, when I was graduating from the Design Academy, I realized that, you know, during university you're making everything yourself and then at a certain point you, like, I wanted to, to go much bigger and more difficult and I, we, I was working on a table um, that really required some very technical glass um, manufacturing and that's not something that I could just go and do myself in the workshop. Um, so that's when I really realized like if you want to push the limits you need to find um, suitable partners who are willing to like take that step with you. Which is also very difficult because a lot of production places don't feel like putting their production on hold for your little experiments. <laughs> um, but I was very fortunate to uh, partner with a, a company in the Netherlands who found it just as exciting as I do to try new things with what they have available um, and change up their production process to see what else is possible. Um, and I think, yeah, from that table, we sort of just kept with that... Um, mentality and kept trying more things and still to this day like now we're working on a, a really big fountain in Shanghai where it's like no one in the in the the whole um, team kind of is really um, sort of experienced in that at all so we're trying to figure out how to do it on the way um, and yeah it's uh, that's that's it's just really exciting to to, to push the limits like that. And have you reached the limits of what the industry today with glass can do? Or are you aware if there are uh, But these there's, always, there's always new innovations and that's also the beauty of, of, of industry that you can sort of tap into things that are happening and, and use that with a, with a creative eye. Um, but no, that's, I, I, I absolutely don't think there is, a, no, there's, the limit is never reached. Can I also ask a question? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Yeah, and it's maybe more about the future uh, than the present project. Uh, but, you know, like, I would like to connect to what Anna said at the beginning, you know, being glass, a very enigmatic material that connects and disconnects, that is open, transparency being a complex notion that it's provides openness and access, but also surveillance, control and oppression, you know, like um, what kind of role or what kind of, um, let's say, possible output um, in your work, digital technologies might have? I mean, in a way, the windows that we experience the most are the windows of our screens. And it's actually the last material threshold before our digital experiences. So the, this thin layer of glass in front of our computer screens or in front of our iPads or phones is the last material reality that actually separates us from the expansion into digital realities. And I know I'm kind of making a leap jump into a different subject, but I, I, I'm curious to understand and to know whether we're reflecting also about the possibility of glass as new kind of interface uh yeah absolutely um so m the, mainly the type of glass that i work with is this this process of layering and laminating and especially within that sort of world there's a lot of um innovations with sort of um incorporating solar um layers in between the glass for example um and there's really exciting new um innovations where 
you know, a, a solar cell doesn't need to look the way that it's always looked. It can also be transparent. Um, or like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that you can put in between glass, actually. And then it opens up a whole new world with, you know, applying it within facades or just objects can, can become smart in a way. Um, so that, you know, for now, my designs are, are, are quite static in a way. They don't offer, you know, um, any kind of um, intelligence other than what they are. But I do imagine that in the future with all this new things happening with, with all these layers you can put within the glass that it, objects can then offer um, many more functions than, than just its form. So, uh, we also have Luis, he's here, <laughs> and uh, he's got this probably unique uh, gallery of, uh, of design, of industrial design. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the only one, well, for sure the only one in Barcelona, maybe the only one in Europe or, or so. Um, but I think that uh, you have this long experience working with uh, designers, for example, uh, Sabine now over here. And I would also like to know, uh, or to share, that you shared with us this uh, experience of working with uh, designers that go to the limit in order to uh, design their, their uh, products. Well, so, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, no, so um, maybe I'd like to, to, to tell a bit the story about just like I, I just like met Sabine's work and, uh, and I think it's important because it's like the first time when I saw like by totally randomly there in Copenhagen like a mirror by her and uh, I just like immediately fell in love and uh, I think that this mirror that was like a small little object like costing almost nothing, has like all the elements and features of the work of Sabine. Like, first of all, like the, um, the source of inspiration that is always like come through nature and the communication uh, of the elements and how he has like create all these reflections and uh, I mean, how the, the, the nature play a, a big role into all these interactions. And secondly, I think like, um, as like um, Ipo said, that um, I think it's a different kind of designer in the sense that uh, she has the she, she, um, the starting point of uh, her work comes from uh, from materiality. So it's like to put in materials to the front. So it's not like like starting with a uh, with a concept or something, but it's like the material who really gives the, um, the, 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 the sense and the content of the, of the, of the piece. So uh, it's just like to take just marble or glass and just like exploring the boundaries about how to produce this or like here in the case of the pavilion was extremely difficult just to have all these curve uh, chest longs and just to, to do like a, these big seats. And uh, I think like this was a part of the conceptual process that comes through the materiality of the, of the, of the pieces. And, uh, and also, yes, I think it's very important just yes, to say about the, um, the excellence in the production. I think it's like, um, it's totally a feature uh, in, in Sabine's work. I mean, like how pieces are made, I mean, how they're, they're finishing. I mean, when you are working with contemporary design and especially with limited editions, that they are not like test to mass production, uh, sometimes it's not, it's not usual to find like people or designers to take so much attention into the details. And now, I mean, if you see the pieces here, the one, the one exhibited in the pavilion, but all, all of them created by her, they, you, you just like can feel how everything is like so well done. I mean, there is like, there is no mistakes, like, uh, like the, all the joints are, are perfect. Like, uh, so I mean, this, this, these three things that I saw in the, at the beginning, in this um, small little mirror uh, in Copenhagen like five years ago, now in this uh, project, which was like the more ambitious, the most ambitious projects that have been did till now, uh, I think there is still a constant into the um, into the pieces, and I really like just to see how just like um, just like how just see develop the work, but uh, I still has the the, the 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 same feelings and uh, and find just the the, the the same characteristics that uh, that I found in the at the beginning, and this is like um, yeah. Anna and Hippolito, I know that you have another, both of you have other appointments right now. 
Uh, so we are very thankful. I'm very thankful that you were able to be here with us today and to share this part of the conversation. I'll keep asking one more question and then we'll also have Pim Top, uh, who took the photographs, and uh, Sophia as well, speak about the speaking about the design. So I know that, uh, well, you have to go to another meeting and so, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and really for important. writing the beautiful yeah. text thank as you. well. And we'll thank be in you. touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I had one more question, Luis, uh, for you. You also have uh, a wonderful knowledge on Lina Bobardi's uh, furniture. Yeah. And Lina Bobardi always spoke about this kind of balance between the rationality and the furniture so that she did and the issue of creating emotions with it. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, any possible connection to what you saw Well, here? I think like the connection is like very evident in the sense like uh, when just like Sabine started to do, to, started to do this project, like uh, it's like came to my mind, obviously, the, uh, these vessels that Lina Bobardi designed for the, uh, for the Mass Museum in, in Sao Paulo, that um, the, I don't know, maybe someone like remember, but it's like all these vessels just to place the paintings and not to see anything because the idea, the original idea of the, of the museum was like to create a museum to show artworks, but without walls. So that was like very radical idea uh, back in the 50s. And uh, so then you go there and it's like also has like, uh, a connection with Ms. van der Rohe work uh, about like having this, this amazing space just surrounded by, by, by walls and with these like transparent glass vessels like to show like something else. And, um, and I think yes, this, this connection is, 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 is clear. And obviously, yeah, I mean like how um, there is like, um, yeah, all, the, all these political influences by Lina that I also just find in the work by, uh, by Sabine and uh, and obviously, just like 50 or 60 or 70 years before, uh, after, we're still in the same. I mean, just like we've got, we can talk about uh, a lot about the role of the of the female designer in the in the industry. That is like uh, still uh, for us as a gallery, it uh, takes uh, it's uh, it costs a lot just to find like uh, designers doing like female designers, and uh, when you are trying just to do a group show, and you are still like. Um, uh, not, it's not so easy to find them. So, I mean, it is like some, at some point, um, yeah, we still like a lot of uh, work to do in that sense. And I think like uh, Sabine, of course, is in, is in the forefront and uh, of, the, of, of, of this, uh, since like she has like a, a huge visibility um, and her work these days, yeah. Thank you very much, Luis and Sabine. I think it's getting a bit cold, and we also want to uh, listen to uh, Sophia Schulen. And so you say some words about your experience with the design of the book. It's been a really nice journey. You can sit over there, so maybe Sophia comes here. And Pim, uh, I would also like to ask you uh, to share your experience. On the one hand, uh, you have uh, with the design, and on the other one, taking the photographs and then preparing them, because this has also been another process, uh, preparing them for the publication. Sophia Sulan, who's been the designer. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, when I was thinking about how the book should feel like, I was really inspired by the fact that Sabine did not only take the atmosphere of the pavilion into consideration when designing her objects, but really thought about the architecture of the pavilion, the materiality, the ratios and everything. So I decided to do the same with the book. But instead of thinking about the pavilion, I thought about the objects themselves. So every design decision made in the book is actually based on design decisions that were already made for the objects. So people don't only feel like they can see what happened um, during the intervention, but also feel what people could feel that were there. Um, for example, if you look at this, <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> thank you. So the cover um, consists of two parts. One is the base, which is of course, metaphorically for the pavilion, which was always here and always stayed the same. But then the layer above is, um, see-through and has the colored gradient, which is of course resembling the colored glass that's been used. So 
yeah, this resembles the materi materiality of the works that were here during the intervention. And there's lots of more um, details that you can explore while going through the book. I don't want to tell you all of them yet, so you can uh, do that yourself. Um, but yeah, that's what I try to uh, do. Great, Sophia. <laughs> Great. No, and we are also thankful to Tom Tomoko and David, with whom we were able to work here in Barcelona, and who also gave us some clues, no, on how to f f make some finishing uh, decisions uh, as well. Uh, and so, Pim, I didn't know you, but I've heard a lot about you, and uh, congratulations for these great photos that we're seeing also on the screen. Um, what happens when? I'm not sure if you photograph architecture and uh, if pho uh, taking photographs of furniture is any different, but well, which was your experience with this uh, project? Yeah, usually I photograph mostly for, uh, for designers, so uh, doing something that's a little bit more architectural was, well, exciting. But at the same time, um, yeah, like discussed before and also what, what you mentioned, that all the stuff that Sabine does is very uh, very thought out, and um, yeah, I think the, the, this, the same goes for good architecture. I, I always feel that there's just a, a couple of angles that, that work best, and it's the same for the stuff that Sabine makes. So uh, I never visited this place actually before the, uh, the exhibition of Sabine, and I only knew it from, uh, from the, the magazines, the books, the, the history lessons, and um, yeah, everything just. Everything makes sense here, so it was, it was actually very easy. <laughs> Just had to wait for, for good lighting, that was all. Well, does anybody have any questions from the audience? No questions, but well, maybe uh, what we're also doing today here is celebrating. I mean, this process that began some years ago when we started discussing about this project, and it takes time. Uh, but it's nice when after all this time these uh, proposals see light and then finally we are also able to explain the publication, speak about its contents, speak about the photography, speak about the uh, design, all its uh, different perspective and understand that this is a work uh, of, uh, of a group of people as, uh, as always. So the publication, Sabine has wonderfully signed 500 copies, we've published 500 copies. This is 499, eh? where's 500, who knows? Um, and, uh, and so it's a, this limited edition of 500 copies that you can also uh, purchase. Today was a 30% discount at the shop of the, uh, here in the Barcelona Pavilion, while we also uh, enjoy a cocktail outside and have a, a, a drink. Uh, while we celebrate uh, this, uh, well, this moment of presentation of the book. And I'm very thankful, uh, Sabine. It's been really nice to work with you. And uh, well, we'll continue doing things together for sure. Luis, same thing. We've uh, gone on meeting. Uh, thank you all from those of you who have participated. Hippolito, Anna, Pim. Um, um, uh, so, uh, Sophia, <laughs> I need to eat something and to have some drinks. So uh, thank you all for following us also online. And uh, thank you all for being over here. Thank you.